Um, back in the book of Nehemiah, we've been doing some lessons in Nehemiah. Not a big verse by verse, you know, like I usually do. Just looking at a few lessons here and there. And I've made it to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11. I'm looking at Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 11 through 23. So if you want to go ahead and go there, Nehemiah 4, 11 through 23. So it says in Nehemiah 4, 11, And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. So Nehemiah, just like you, if you're in the work of the Lord, you got all these adversaries coming at you, and they just want you to quit working. They want to stop you, make fun of you, persecute you, do whatever they got to do to get the work to cease. And it says, And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places from which you shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So they got these guys informing them about what these guys got planned against them. And it says, Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergeons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it up, build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so built it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half, half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at that time said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night there may be a guard to us, and labor on the day. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, None of us put off our clothes, saving that every one put them off for washing. So, we're looking at Nehemiah 4, 11 through 23 that we just read. And we're going to talk about building and battling. And you can compare the Christian life to Nehemiah and Judah's wall building experience. They had to build and they also had to battle. And in your Christian life, you began building on the foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.12, your foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, you've been battling. Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You begin battling the spirit world. You begin battling the flesh. Paul talks about it. Many times, he said but in Romans 7, 23, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. We're battling the spirit world. We're battling the flesh. And the building process isn't going to be the smooth process you thought it would be because you got all this adversaries trying to stop the work. There's going to be many dangers tolls and snares if you're working for the Lord. So let's talk about who we are battling and then let's talk about our strategy that we're going to use against them. So the battling. Who are we battling? Number one, subtle adversaries. Look 
Back there at Nehemiah 4 again, we're battling these subtle adversaries. In Nehemiah 4 and verse 11, it says, And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to see. Cause the work to cease. They said they shall not know. They're not going to see till we come among them and slay them. You see, they're subtle adversaries. You see, this guy Sanballat had mustered up the army of Samaria back there in uh, Nehemiah 4.2. He mustered up the, a whole army. And their plan is to cheap shot the wall builders and take them by surprise. I thought they called them weak and feeble Jews. If they're so weak and feeble Jews, then why you got to be such a subtle adversary? Why you got to get an army? Why you got to do a surprise attack? And you're battling these subtle adversaries. And for me and you today, it's not flesh and blood. It's spirits and people that you're battling. You see, Paul warns us also about the subtlety of Satan. Over in uh, 2 Corinthians 11.3, he says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You see, the serpent beguiles, he's subtle. And he warns of those who creep into houses. 2 Timothy 3.6. In 2 Timothy 3.6, he says, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. He says there are many adversaries. 2 Corinthians 16, 9. Peter calls the devil your adversary and makes it personal. 1 Peter 5, 8. You know, I, I believe that the devil is going to tempt you personally. You see, when you're building... You're building, this building is what you're going to present to Jesus Christ when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.12. And when you're building this building, don't be so surprised when, you're, when your kids start acting wild, when your wife goes crazy, when your work goes berserko, or you're only met with discouraging words all the time because it's the spirits in people that you're battling. This, these spirits will get in your work. They'll get in your kids. They'll get in your wife. You're not really wrestling with flesh and blood. If, like Ephesians 6.12 says, it's the spirits that's getting a hold of that flesh and blood. These subtle adversaries. That's what you're battling. If you consider how the devil is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 2, it can give you patience in your battles. It can give you sympathy and patience with the people around you because you know they are led by the same father that you used to have. John 8, 44, he, Jesus tells them, you are of your father, the devil. So the subtle adversaries is the spirits and people. And the next little adversary you got is shattering news. Look at verse 12 of Nehemiah 4. This, you ever, you didn't ever think about this, but news can be your enemy. It can be your adversary. It says in Nehemiah 4.12, And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places, when she shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So, you mean, these guys are warning them. You know, these guys is about to do a surprise attack on you. They are warning them. The Jews which dwelt by the enemies came and told Nehemiah and them guys and warned them about an ambush being planned by the enemy. You know, it's good to be informed, but they told them ten times. It's good to be informed about what's going on in the world, but the devil himself will use current events, current threats, TikTok conspiracies, uh, and stuff on YouTube and Facebook and on the news to scare you out of the race, to scare you out of the work. 
You know, a lot of what the saints intake today into their mind is fear mongering at best. It's it's not it's not you, you know you you're saying well I'm just staying informed. No, you're putting all this unnecessary fear on you. And you know some guys think teaching on the current events is the Lord's work. Just always just that's all they do is the current events, current events. But it can slowly turn into daily news that just shatters the saint's faith and leaves him in the spirit of fear. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, you see guys that just do this, everything that they put out is just current events stuff. It's just putting the spirit of fear in people. And you talk to people, and they're just overwhelmed with fear about things that are going on. You know, in Galatians 1 4, what does Paul call it? A present evil world. We know we are in a present evil world. So I don't have to have continuous, up to date news about the wickedness going on to find that out. I'm better off I'm better off to set my affection on things above, like Colossians 3 2 talks about, and take no thought for the morrow as the Lord Jesus talks about in Matthew 6, 34, and just work like it's my last day every day. Uh, this The shattering news that you get all the time. You know, when people see me reading the Bible, they don't say, man, I love that scripture, or I love that story over here. It's, did you hear about this? Have you heard about that? And it's just some current event that's got their nerve shot and has given them the spirit of fear. We got subtle adversaries, the spirits in people, just like those spirits behind Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom. You got the spirits in people, the people at your job, the people in your home, maybe the people in your church giving you a hard time. You got shattering news that's giving your mind a hard time. You're better off to set your affection on things above. So that's the people you... That's what you're battling. The the flesh, the devil, the shattering news, the spirits and people. Now here's your strategy. Here's our strategy. Subject your thoughts. Nehemiah tells them to be ye not afraid. And he tells them to remember the Lord. Look at Nehemiah. 4 and verse 13 so they just got this shattering news and it says therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords their spears and their bows now he's he's been informed he's not just dwelling on it he's prepared and he says in verse 14 and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people Here's the key. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. So, you know, it is good to be informed, but just dwelling on the shattering news and letting it overtake you, that's not good. He's been informed and he says, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord. That's how you don't be afraid. You remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Well, you get your face with this news that's great and terrible. Oh, well, I got a God that's more great and more terrible. So Nehemiah's, Nehemiah tells them, be ye not afraid. Remember the Lord. So you subject your thoughts. That's the thing. That's what we're looking at now. Subject your thoughts. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. You know, instead of folding and giving up over the shattering news, he encouraged them to be not afraid. Jeremiah 1, 8 says, be not afraid of their faces. Ezekiel 2, 6 says, be not afraid of their words, and nor be dismayed at their looks. 1 Peter 3, 14 says, be not afraid of their terror. Terrorists? 
shattering news that sends terror down people's spine. First Peter three fourteen says, "Be not afraid of their terror." You see, you won't be in perfect peace while fearing man and having fearful thoughts. In Proverbs twenty nine, twenty five, it says, "The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe." You see, if your mind is continuously stuck on current tragedies in the world. You need to get your thoughts in captivity or the fear will just rob you of your joy. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You need to have where, have it Try to make it to where every thought that comes into your mind is a thought that would please Jesus Christ. The fear of the shattering news will put your mind off the battle and you'll quit building. So you got to subject your thoughts. So Nehemiah said, Remember the Lord. When you are afraid, when you were afraid, what happens? You forget about the Lord. You forget He's all-powerful. You forget He's great and terrible. You forget He's living inside you, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You forget that He's walking with you. But you got to look at Him. Hebrews 12.2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So our strategy is, when the enemy comes, we subject our thoughts. We also, the next thing, remember sons, daughters, and wives. In verse 14 of Nehemiah chapter 4, Nehemiah 4, 14, it says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your houses. So, subject your thoughts and remember sons, daughters, and wives. You fight for them. You remember the Lord, but also when I think about my wife, my kids, the people I care about, it'll soften your heart so that the Lord can work easier in you. And it can give you motivation to battle and to build. You get your mind off the shatter of news. You get your mind off yourself. And you start thinking about the people that need you. It softens your heart. In the front of my Bible, I tape pictures of my kids. I tape them in there. And when I open my Bible, this softens my heart as soon as I open the Bible. When you realize the fight isn't about making you look good or making you look happy, but rather it's for the Lord and the people around you, then you'll have joy in the Lord. You see, think about joy. Think about the letters in joy. J, Jesus, O, others, and then Y, you. So it should go Jesus first, others second, and then you last. You subject your thoughts. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. Subject your thoughts with keep your sons, daughters, wives, the brethren. Let them be on your mind. Then the next thing is you got your servants in place. That's what Nehemiah did. He put his servants in place. Nehemiah did this. He put his servants in place. In Nehemiah 4, 14, he said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Then look at 16. It says, And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half held both the spears and the shields and the habergens and the rulers we're behind all the house of Judah. And then look at verse 
19. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. So they're still working. They've heard that they've been informed about this shattering news. They're spread out, one far from another. And Nehemiah's got his servants in place. Nehemiah sat in the lower places behind the wall. He set some on the higher places. Verse 14, he had half the men working. He had half holding weapons, as you see in verse 16. He had people separated on the wall far from another. Verse 19, you see that? And in building and battling, you put the people in the right place. Nehemiah put the people in the right place. And see, in this Christian fight, it can't just be you. It's got to be you and other saved people. And you're gonna, you, we're all servants. And we all need to be in the right place. He put the servants in the right place. Look at verse 16. It says, And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergens, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. So he's got his servants in place. And you think about this, shields of faith. He, he had some to have shields. Here's your shields of faith. Nehemiah had some of them hold shields. Compare this to the shield of faith in Ephesians 6, 16. Most likely in your fellowship, and the people that you fellowship with, there's a person with faith, and he rubs off on the rest of the group. Maybe an old man or old woman of the faith. Maybe they can't work like the younger ones, but they can pray a shield of faith around everybody else. James 5.15. So there's your shields of faith. He had some hold shields. Number two, you got spears for close reins. You got shields of faith, and then you got spears for close range. Nehemiah had some men holding spears, and that's a great close range weapon. And when we pray, we aren't just praying for future things, but things that are right in our face. So many times I'm praying for something that's right in my face, and I'm wanting that prayer answered right at that moment. You see, sometimes you pray for things that are happening in the moment or close by, and you become instant in prayer, as Romans 12, 12 talks about. And many times I've had the prayer answered in the moment or the next day or the next week, and these prayers are like spears for the enemy, close range. So you got shields of faith. You got spears for close range. And then number three, you got support for from the from bows support from bows he said half of them held both the spears the shields and the bows nehemiah had some holding these bows a long range weapon some you see some things happen in a moment from day to day and are right up close and personal out of nowhere so you needed spears a close range some things are coming from far off for this, you need bows and arrows. And you can have men praying for the work to continue for years and years to come. So the present time is prayed for, the future is prayed for, and then sins of the past are confessed. You got shields. You got shields of faith. People with faith that can rub off on everybody. You got spears for close range. People praying for things in the moment that you're facing. You got support from bows. People praying that the work will continue on, on into the future. And then the next thing, he's got soldiers working tirelessly. In verse 15, it says, And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one to his work. So he's got soldiers working tirelessly. Everyone unto his work. Not laying down. Not falling down in fear. 
but soldiers working tirelessly. The workers returned to the wall, some working with one hand and holding a weapon in the other hand. In verse 17, it says, They which built it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. You see, that's an amazing thing. A sword girded by their side as they built. Compared to a Bible believer taking his Bible everywhere that he goes. The work is great and large, it says in verse 19. It says, And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large. You know, it's a big work. But what does he say? In Nehemiah 4.20, And what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye tither unto us, our God shall fight for us. The work is great and large, but the Lord is going to fight for you. And you got to be a soldier working tirelessly. Nehemiah had some holding the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. You see, the thing about the Lord's work is that it can be done 24 hours a day. While you're not working, you can be thinking about the things of God and praying. While you're not working, you can be meditating on the scriptures. And see, in verse 23, it says, Neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. They only took off their clothes to bathe. That's the only time they took their work clothes off. And the thing is, you can do something for the Lord while you're bathing even. You know, when I'm in the shower, I play Alexander Scorby on YouTube. Or I listen to preaching while I'm taking a shower. You can memorize scripture while you're shampooing. Multitasking is key. Just like them, they were multitasking. Verse 17, they, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work... And with the other hand, they held a weapon. Multitasking is key. That's how you get things done. So he had the shields of faith. He had spears for close range. He had support from bows. He had soldiers working tirelessly, multitasking. So they were simultaneously, this is the next thing, simultaneously building and watching. They were on guard with a weapon with one hand and building on the other hand. So simultaneously building and watching, sword in hand. A key to getting things built is, like I said, multitasking. You know, I realized working 50 hours a week on a regular job, caring for my wife, having two kids, that's going to take up a lot of time. So I must keep the sword in hand or girded by my side at all times. And when I say sword, I'm talking about Hebrews 4.12, sword. If I'm jumping on the trampoline with my kids, playing hide-and-seek or tag or riding bikes with the kids, I can tell them a Bible story. I can teach them a Bible doctrine at the same time. I'm multitasking. I can listen to preaching and teaching an audio Bible while working. I can pull out my sword, Hebrews 4.12, on break and take notes, put outlines together, or do my... Daily Bible reading. I can keep the sword in hand during my daily battles. If you've got the sword in hand, then you've always got it with you, and you can just instantly pull it out. It says in verse 17, They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. Instead of having your iPhone in your pocket, Get you a small pocket Bible and put it in there where you usually keep your phone. And then when you go to reach for your phone, it's going to be that Bible. And you can pull it out. You got it with you at all times. You see, they didn't let the work stop. They didn't, they didn't let the work stop them from being on guard. And they didn't let being on guard stop them from working. You know, we can sit at Jesus' feet like Mary. And we can serve like Martha. But at the same time, simultaneously building and watching, sword in hand. The next thing, 
sound the trumpet if needed. Nehemiah said in verse 20, In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. Sound the trumpet if needed. You know, if needed, stop working. If they heard a trumpet, they would stop working and they would gather together ready to fight. You see, sometimes you're going to get around the brothers and sharpen each other's iron. Iron sharpeneth iron, Proverbs 27, 17. You're going to need them to refresh you. So you're going to, sometimes you're going to stop working. Sound the trumpet if needed. You know, when you gather together, that's like sounding the trumpet, gathering together. Sit down and relax. Sometimes you're going to have to come apart and rest or you're going to overdrive yourself. Genesis 33, 13. You're going to overdrive yourself and burn out. And when you start feeling a burnout, overwhelmed, depressed, or too tired, that's the sound of a trumpet. Because the adversary will use these things to get you burnt out and you'll stop the work permanently. Sometimes you're going at a sprint, sometimes at a jog, sometimes you're walking, and then sometimes you need to sit down. But the devil would love to take advantage of the flesh that is burnt out and tired. So you need to you need to picture that as the sound of the trumpet that's saying, Hey, the adversary's here, quit working and gather together. And let's work together against these adversaries. You see, you don't have your glorified body just yet. The devil's going to take advantage of your flesh when it's burnt out and tired. So you sound the trumpet if needed. You're simultaneously building and watching. You got your servants in place with the shield of faith, the spears for close range, the support from bows, the soldiers working tirelessly. You got your... You subject your thoughts. You got your mind stayed on the Lord. You got your sons, your daughters, your wives, the brethren on your mind. You're realizing you're battling these subtle adversaries, the spirits in people, the shattering news. But the Lord has called you to maintain good works. And he's laid the foundation for you to build upon. He has allowed attacks from the spirit world to train you and to humble you and to make you a battle-hardened soldier you know, building and battling is an opportunity to earn rewards. Building and battling is a chance to make you a better man. Building and battling is an opportunity to get you closer to Jesus Christ because you need him to do both. You need him to, well, you do both of these things. Are you going to get to building or just call out from work every day until the rapture? Are you going to lay down the shield and the sword and the helmet? The enemy is going to attack you whether you come to the battlefield or not. So you better just go ahead and put on the whole armor of God and come to the battle.